And since you are in the Netherlands, I'll talk to you a little bit about how the, we think we are going to deal with sea level rise. This is the areas below storm surge level. So what we did, we knew all these GCM and climate predictions and we calculated with international experts how much the sea level would rise. And this is the Met Office with the most probable sea level rise, like in 2100 between 30 and 80 centimeters. But we wanted to know, you know, what is the upper scenario, upper end scenario, because what to do with our cities in the sea. And an upper scenario was made as well, if worst comes to the worst, and then we predict up to two meter sea level rise in the next 150 years. What does this mean for a country that's so below sea level? You know, this is one option. Just put all investments in the east where it's higher, and the mayors in this area love it. But when you just make a simple calculation and find out what it costs to maintain the dikes in the Netherlands, to heighten them even, and what it would cost to move all investments, you know, the cost of keeping our feet dry in the Netherlands is less than 1% of GDP, of our national GDP. And even with sea level rise, it would probably go up from 0.4 to 0.8% of GDP, so less than 1%, even with one or two meter sea level rise. So the idea is we'll stay where we are and just see what we can do. And this is, of course, one option, and engineers would love to build it, just a big seawall, there's enough sand in the North Sea to make it, some few big locks in it, but of course it would really hamper the ecosystem. This would be an alternative to continue in the way of the last 50 years, just reinforce the dikes, shorten them. The problem is then when rivers start producing more water, we might, the water might get stuck there. We couldn't get rid of it quickly enough. So this is not a preferred option. The preferred option is this one. Leave it open as much as possible and just reinforce the dikes. And even put lots of sand on the beach. And fortunately there's so much sand in the North Sea, we can do things like this, you know, just with these hopper dredgers. Just put lots of sand on the beach. Uh, here is, this is where you are somewhere, uh, Amsterdam. This is the North and just, this is now the formal strategy of the Netherlands, just put lots of sand on the beach, like here in the north of Holland. This was the situation three years ago, a vulnerable seawall. It's been completely buried in sand. This is the same seawall with like 300 feet of sand in front of it. In Rotterdam we're doing this, you know, major big dikes integrated in the landscape, even the houses on the dike, so just reinforce it. This is what the Germans do, put their offices along the Alp on piles. Well, this is what's happening in Venice. And they put underwater mobile barriers, and I'll show you a picture. So that's being built, and now it's nearly finished. So they come up when the Adriatic Sea gets higher. This, of course, is major investments. It's like billions a year in the Netherlands and worldwide. And this you can do top down. You know the meteorological information. You can build some scenarios on sea level rise and you can set out your engineering path. But what about the other aspects, and what about the cities and the rural areas uh, where people live and somebody's owner of the land and it's not the public infrastructure. So we'll not just have sea level rise with climate change and higher peak flows, but there's temperature rise in the cities, every two to six degrees higher, which is not so nice. And I'll show you what we may be able to do about it, but also more frequent and more intense heat waves. Like, you know, in, these, in Paris up to 40 or plus 40 degrees. More frequent and prolonged drought, which may spoil all your green parks in the city. More frequent and more intense peak rainfall. And then we talk about all these cities, with even more than 
a million inhabitants. And then about what they all should do. They should work on insulation and more shade from heat, adjustments in the buildings, maybe air conditioning, but then on renewable energy, and how do you get that? More green in the cities, including green rooftops, more water buffering. You know, if it rains very heavily here in Amsterdam, we'll, uh, the city government does not keep up with all the pavements with the heavy rain. Uh, so it would run into the houses. Uh, so more buffering to overcome long periods of droughts, but also of big rainfall. And of course, if you have a city like this, and this is one of my colleagues picks it, well, you know, you can adapt, there is water storage, whatever. This may be the ideal city of the future, but the present situation is like this. Sorry for the clarity, but I have a few of them. You know, this. How will these cities adapt to two to six degrees higher peak temperature and to much more excessive rainfall? Lots of work to do, because these cities are built according to the historic climate. And if it goes up, I say two to six, but it could be more in some areas, and, and peaks could be even more. Well, there you go. And then the awareness, you know, there is 70%, 68% of all cities has not even started yet to think about it. While in the Netherlands we are building all these dikes and Florida is active, Boston is active, Bangladesh is even active. While the cities are a forgotten space when it comes to climate adaptation. Lots of vulnerability assessments have been done. Like 34% at the supranational level. 23% at country level, you know, by meteorologists, they tell you this is going to happen. But an, an owner of a house doesn't know what to do with it. At city level, only 5% of all studies on climate impacts have been done at city level. At, say, useful level for city managers. And this is then what happens. Some consultants were asked and researchers, you must make a heat map of the city of Ghent. It took them 286 pages to say something about the future of heat in Ghent. This is Bangladesh, climate impacts on extreme rainfalls in Bangladesh. This is the file offered to the policymakers there. This is what the Germans did. They are very Gründlich, you know. So they made 15 scenarios and model cup, 13 time steps for four seasons, and they had a thousand maps. And you're a city manager, yeah? a thousand maps. And indeed, this is what's going on. The whole idea on climate impact has started top down, you know, from the big global circulation models, GCMs, to regionalization to statistical analysis and then impacts, but then with all these scenarios and all these uncertainties. And we discovered that this is not very useful when you talk about the more municipal scale adaptation, where most of the money prob probably goes, more than even coastal defense. You know, if your peak rainfall increases by 40% for water management, that's a lot. If your heat at night goes up by four or five degrees. That means your buildings will be too warm for most people, unless there is full air conditioning. So what to do with existing cities and infrastructure? Should we all modify it? Well, you know, that's such a big task, we won't even start. So we said, let's go for bottom up. And this is what you can do. You first look at the existing problems in the city. This is indeed the issue. Lots of research over the last 20 years has been done by top-down adaptation ideas, but these mostly academics could not reach the municipal adaptation. <coughs> this last mile is the most difficult, where you need fit information, because in a city one has problems with aging population, environmental pollution, social issues, population decline, oh yes, and maybe even a bit of climate change, which is a long-term thing, so it ends up at the bottom of the agenda. 
Adaptation is just one of many issues. Mitigation, uh, so reducing greenhouse gases and CO2 has a priority. There are limited resources, and if it is addressed, one usually calls the Met Office, and then they get you know, these 280 pages. Uh, and if addressed, it's often top-down and sectoral. So we try to develop a solution and more or less design the concept adaptation as you go, where you focus on existing urban problems, ambitions and plans, and introduce climate resilient solutions. And this is working. Then you first inquire about the major plans. Every city has ambitions and plans. Then you develop simple, easy, accessible, relevant climate information and you organize a participatory process, so with the civil servants, but also with some NGOs, science and private sector representatives in the city, so what to do. And this was done, triggered by problems, for example, in Den Helder a city in the Netherlands, they had low income housing, some social issues, they wanted to restructure the neighborhood, and then we came in and said, well, you know, if you do a little bit this and a little bit that, then you're much more climate resilient. A similar example in the city of Reden, where they had problems with city shrinkage, demographic change, what to do, well, we could advise to integrate adaptation in their future plans. A German city, similar story. And of course, on adaptation, you always touch private property. So you need participation, you need people and owners to on board. It's not just shifting a little bit uh, your water pipe, but it's also the sewage, the water in the street. Maybe green roofs can do a lot. Uh, so, um, this was just my introduction, and now I can show you how we address this, how we compiled all the information. And I show you a few examples from internet, and I hope it will work. I'll show you how we did The Hague on heat stress in 2050, where we had climate scenarios on the one hand and development scenarios on the other hand. Because, of course, if you talk about 2050, the city is not the same city as today anymore. So, and I'll show, we made a matrix. On the one hand, two or three climate scenarios. On the other hand, two or three development scenarios. And then put that in one picture. Then I go to Amsterdam. Then we go to Bangladesh. And then one more on land use. And these examples are taken from a group specifically developed to visualize and simplify climate data for purposes of awareness raising and priority setting, not just for the final engineering, but for the, well, the get the discussion going. And it turned out that for many adaptation solutions, you did not need these very sophisticated data. If just an architect knows it's going to rain more, say, ah, whether it's 10 or 20 percent, that's not so important. I just design it, it can take 30 percent, and everyone's happy. Because he does not do incremental changes in the design, but a radical change such that the whole concept is slightly different and not necessarily even more expensive. So the quality of the data, the direction should be good, but it doesn't have to be uh, at the last digit. Uh, let's see how I can get now to the uh, internet, which is always a challenge for me. There you go. Hmm. Well, I guess I have to step. Okay. Yeah, this is the Hague example. This is the city of the Hague. And of course, then you need a parameter, an index. What is important? For example, the number of nights, it's in your room above 20 degrees. Then you don't sleep very comfortable. You'd rather have it. And the number of nights in the inner city above per year, above 20 degrees is like say 10 or 12. That's doable. You know, you don't buy air conditioning yet if it's just like a, a few nights. 
But what would happen, and this is under the present scenario, if I move my mouse to the one of the climate scenarios or the other one, you can see what that would mean for the number of nights under the present urban structure. But I could also look at a more development structure, rapid development, and more rapid development, I believe. And then you see how it changes. So this is the number of nights in the present urban situation. This is for one scenario with some warming, but no changes in wind direction. And this is one which changes more easterly winds in summer. But then you could also show if this is the number of nights presently and there is no climate change and the city would expand a bit, then it would not become a problem. But of course, with climate change, this scenario would produce you like uh, 28 nights. But under the little more intense scenario, it would be like, you know, 40 nights above 20 degrees. So then you would really have to take measures. And this little map shows these guys as much information as the 280 pages. That's all I want to say. But I have a few more examples. That's, um, yeah, we go to Amsterdam now. And here you see, you know, we can go for flooding by the sea, by rain, by drought. We go to heat. And we could look at the maximum water depth that would happen. Let's see. Let's go for, for a rain flooding. And then for the present situation. Then this would be the water depth when a peak rainfall arrives that happens only once in 10 years, one in 10 event. I have something here, I believe. Yeah, so this is the one in 10 downpour. I can also go at the one in 100 downpour. This is what, what policymakers find important. Then it gets m deeper. You could even go to the level of the uh, groundwater. It could go to the height and even to what happens in the small lakes with respect to ox oxygen. We could also take it from an aerial or from the topography, whatever. And then we could do, for example, for the severe case of climate change, what would happen? And the interesting thing, of course, you can zoom in, and then we could even find out actually what's happening here. That's one. Uh, let's see. We could do the same for drought. Or, yeah, this is drought. And then the present situation, well, may not be in this one. For heat, it's there. Ah. So we go to the heat. Well, one way or another, it's not in this one. But I hope you believe me that this is what can be done, and you can access this as well. Let's now go at, say, Bangladesh. Interactive climate map in Bangladesh, where you would rather have piles of information. How to simplify this? And actually, these are maps that are developed together with the civil servants and even the village chiefs in Bangladesh. And it's also a combination of future development in land use and future developments in climate and what this would mean. 
It starts with a number of climate scenarios. <coughs> this is the current climate with respect to, well, you could take temperature or you could take rainfall. Uh, this is some kind of rainfall, and what do I have here? It says the average number of wet days. Uh, and then for, for this time, for 2050, well, various scenarios. I hope you will believe me. And then also on climate impact maps, all this information is condensed. And you can go for a land use one for an elevation, soil types, country boundaries, well, what have you. And then you can look at the area of rice production, uh, at the frequency of flooding, under these different scenarios. And that's indeed what what you can do with geographic information system, but simplify and condense it so that you don't confront policymakers with big data. And these are at, at a very detailed level. You can zoom in in every village and see your scenarios on climate and on rice production in this, uh, this event. Let's see, then my final one is on land use in the province of the Netherlands. Uh, that's this one again. The province of Gelderland, where urban issues but also farming issues play together. The internet of the hotel is uh, probably a bit overloaded, but it should be coming. And these are maps, you know, that were used also on a map table together with citizens and civil servants to discuss the implications of climate change for agriculture. And again, here the idea is as well that you have future options on land use and you have future climate scenarios and some people say well you know I want to expand or then what would this mean for the water management temperature management uh, for groundwater is in it as well well I'm afraid this one in Gelderland uh, ah there it is saved by the bell again here you have these different uh, climate scenarios, all very well documented by the Met Office. And here you find the land use scenarios. And this is the province. And then you have this three by three matrix that gives you future land use scenarios with future climate scenarios. And then you can choose what you want to see, like this one is on water, uh, too much, this is on water shortages, and this is on heat. And you can even include the risk of bushfire in it, uh, uh, so there is all what was relevant in relation to climate was in there. So every cell has its own combination of a land use scenario and a climate scenario. Well, that's it. I go back to my presentation. And, uh, oh no, I have one more to go. Uh, this is, uh, we've seen all the examples from the uh, internet. And there is one more thing, you know, when is your adaptation policy successful? And we discovered, we, we developed an, an index, and the index we call the adaptation deficit. You can imagine that every spot on Earth has some kind of annual average damage due to weather events. 
Of course, it happens maybe only one every 10 years, but you can even it out over 10 years, then you have your average annual damage in millions euro. So do we have every city has its ever average annual flooding damage or wind damage. And of course, if the climate changes and more extremes will hit you, this average annual damage will increase. And what we calculated is the changes in the annual average damage at municipal level. So then you have your adaptation deficit. And of course you can reduce the projected average annual damage by taking measures. And now we have indeed for all the municipalities in the Netherlands the cost of climate if you do not do anything on adaptation, on preventive adaptation. And this is the low estimate per municipality, and this is the high estimate. And usually it's between now and 2050 in the order of a, a few hundred million euro. For cities, maybe a billion in 50 years as average annual damage due to climate. We also did it per inhabitant. So you see some of these uh, low populated areas have a high <coughs> average annual damage per capita which indeed means they will be in trouble over 50 years unless there is some kind of national solidarity or whatever so this way you politicize the issue as well what does a national government do what do individual citizens have to take care for themselves finally my conclusions and then there is some time for discussion Bottom-up adaptation strategies are more effective than top-down approaches, particularly at urban level. Participation of stakeholders is crucial. This requires easy accessible data information. And that's my message. There must be a world to gain in your profession to simplify and visualize. And this is crucial. And I showed you examples from a foundation that was established just to do this. It was established last year, there's now some five or ten people working in it and they produced all the examples I showed you and they're accessible through the internet. Thank you, Chairman. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much.